As the Raiders continue with OTAs, what is a position or positions that is still an area of concern? That plus a whole lot more comes up on Wednesday's edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast for May 29th, 2024. You are Locked On Raiders, your daily Las Vegas Raiders podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome in Raider Nation to another edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast. Thank you so much for making the show your first listen of the day. Make sure you subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts to get the latest edition of the show as soon as it becomes available. As always, if you're giving us a look on YouTube, you know we appreciate that. The show continues to grow each and every day in a short amount of time. Uh, the show is really blowing up over 14,000 subscriptions. We definitely appreciate that. So shout out to you, Raider Nation, and shout out to my man, Ari, who makes it all possible. He's the guy that makes everything go. Without him, there is no Locked On Raider podcast YouTube page. So Shout out to Ari. He's on Twitter at Ari Produces. You can hit him up, and you can hit me up as well at your boy Q254. We got the Lockdown Raider Podcast voicemail line, 707-654-4693. You want to be a part of the show, you can hit us up that way. And as always, a lot of feedback, a lot of calls, a lot of texts about a lot of different subjects that we've got going on, and I love it. It's May. It's the end of May, and we still have a lot of great conversations going on on the show and a lot of feedback. So shout out to you, Raider Nation, for all the feedback. We'll get as many calls and texts coming up in segment number three as possible. In segment number two, I had a good conversation with my guy, Justin Mello, from the Draft Network. He actually did a piece on uh, Trayvon Merrick, the Raiders' safety. He's a guy going into the final year of his rookie contract, why this could be a really big year. And, of course, that goes with the conversation that we've been having here on the show about guys that could be in line for a contract extension before the season guys that could maybe get that contract extension following the season. So it just happened to be great timing. I had him on my radio show, Unnecessary Roughness, on Radio Nation Radio 920. You'll hear that conversation in segment number two. Here in segment number one, want to talk about uh, potential position groups that could still be a concern for the Silver and Black as they're in OTAs. We'll be out at OTAs uh, today. I'm excited about that, being able to talk to assistant coaches like Marvin Lewis and more. So we look forward to that. We'll see some more of practice, and we'll hear from some players following practice as well. But what are some position groups that are areas of concern? We'll jump right into that after I tell you about the title sponsor of the show, which is FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. I'll tell you more about them following segment number one. But let's go ahead and jump right into it. And the way that this conversation came up about position groups that could still be concerned, it all started with the conversation I had with Amber Thea Harris and Kirk Morrison on Amber's uh, radio show on Sirius XM Radio on Tuesday morning. They had me on talking all things Raiders, which what a fantastic uh, opportunity that is, right? Amber Thea Harris, uh, Kirk Morrison, and myself all talking Raiders. That, that, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, two of my favorite people. But she asked me a question that really got the ball going and really had me thinking about uh, not only the position she asked about, but every other position that could still be an area of concern for the silver and black. So here's Amber Thea Harris from her Sirius XM radio show asking the question about a certain position group. Check it out. So Q, um, other than the quarterback, because I'm not going to lie, The quarterback position does have me concerned. I feel very comfortable with so many parts of of that team. But the quarterback, you can't win without an elite quarterback. It just is what it is. The Trent Dilfer days of winning a Super Bowl, (laughs) I believe, are past in in the NFL. But I also do know to have – if you're going to put all of your chips into the defense basket, you're going to say, all right, we are going to be good on offense. We're going to be great on defense. We're going to give up 16 points or less a game and be one of the most dominant defenses of all time. And that is how we're going to compete, especially within the AFC West against somebody like Patrick Mahomes. If you're going to do that, you have to have not only a strong defensive front, which everybody's excited about with Christian Wilkins and with Max Crosby, you have to have a really strong secondary. Yep. You know, Warren Sapp used to always say to me in NFL Network, the front and the back end work together. And that's how it is. And there were rumors out there that when the Raiders had their first pick in the draft, it, not even rumors, Terry and Arnold said, <laughs> that <Right>. Antonio <laughs> Pierce told him this, that there was a coin flip between Brock Bowers and between uh, Terry and Arnold. Now, Antonio Pierce has since denied that. But, man, I really – if they didn't go quarterback, if they didn't trade up to go quarterback, I would have loved to have seen there were so many good corners on the board at that point. Um, I'm not – Brock Bauer's great. 12 personnel, excited. Can't wait to see what they do with that. But, man, do you feel like the cornerback position – 
um, it's still a question mark for the Raiders. So there it is. You hear how Amber talked about the cornerback position and the fact that that room could still be a question mark. And I think that that was a very valid point that she brought up. And everyone knows that uh, I had selected Terry Allen Arnold on the Locked On uh, Podcast Network the Ultimate Mock Draft that we put together. I had picked him at number 13. He was available at number 13, and they went with Brock Bowers. And I'm not mad at that pick at all. I've said it many times. It was a shock to me when it happened. But, you know, look, he did something or he does something that the Raiders didn't do a lot of in 2023, which is score touchdowns. He's going to help them score a bunch of touchdowns, right? Score more touchdowns, hopefully, than they did in 2023 because they're going to need to score to be able to compete with the likes of the Chiefs, the Chargers, uh, the Denver Broncos, and the rest of the AFC Conference in general. And I do think that cornerback is a concern now they've got guys right I mean we know Jack Jones is going to hold down one side and even though that was a small sample size that he provided once he got picked up off of waivers by the uh, Raiders off the you know uh, when the uh, Patriots waived him I think that he can definitely do that over the course of a season Nate Hobbs in the slot I feel very comfortable with him but who is on the other side who's on the outside which is what my argument was for Terry on Arnold when when I, I slotted him in that spot at number 13 for the Raiders, that he could be that dude across from Jack Jones. But they got Ja'Korian Bennett. He was a fourth-round pick a year ago. They got Brandon Face on. He missed the majority of 2023 with a shin injury, came back at the end. Uh, D. Cam Richardson, the fourth-round pick out of Mississippi State, he's available. MJ Devonshire, the seventh-round pick out of the pit, he's available. Um, so there's other guys, but it's a lot of youth and a lot of inexperience at that position. So who's going to step up? and be that guy. I thought that that was a very valid question. But as I mentioned, that really got the ball rolling when I thought, okay, well, what else is the area of concern? And a lot of people will say, and I actually talked about this on my radio show on Tuesday, a lot of people will point to the offensive line and say, yeah, I still have questions. And I think that's valid to a certain extent. We know three guys that are going to be on that offensive line. We know Colton Miller will be the left tackle. We know Andre James will be the center. And it sounds like Dylan Parham will be the right guard. So I'm assuming, and assumptions are tough, but I'm assuming that uh, Jackson Powers Johnson will end up being the left guard, right? The second round pick. I feel like he's a day one starter. And the only other question is the right tackle. And right now that's Thayer Mumford's job, uh, you know, to lose. So he, he, and he's got some competition there as well. But right now, again, uh, he looks like the leader in the clubhouse at that right tackle position as he's going into the third year of his, you know, rookie contract. So uh, this is a big opportunity for Thayer Mumford. So I think I feel a little bit less you know, anxiety about the offensive line as I do the cornerback room just because I want to know. And if Jack Jones was able to give the production that he gave in 2023 in a small sample size for the Raiders, at some point, teams are probably not going to throw at him as much. So who are they going to go at? Whoever they throw at is going to be a young dude. Even if it's Ja'Korian Bennett, who was, you know, injured, he had that hamstring injury his rookie year, uh, you know, and then when he did get out there on the grass, at times he looked lost in space. So he's got to be able to figure that out. Hopefully the game slows down for one, Ja'Korian Bennett, but also another area, another, um, you know, position group that I looked at and I thought, you know what, this is an area of concern as well, is the big unknown, the running back room, right? Josh Jacobs went, went, went on to Green Bay, and I know everyone won't agree with me, and that's okay, but I think Josh Jacobs is a big loss. I really do. He was the heart and soul of the Raiders team when they didn't have a heart or a soul. Right. When they were searching for answers uh, and they had a bunch of questions, he was waving, waving his hands. He was jumping up and down. He was screaming from the mountaintops. I'll be the answer. I'll be the answer. When Antonio Pierce took over as the head coach, what's the first thing he said? I need that guy. I need Josh to be the engine. I need him to go. We go as Josh goes. He knows what the, he means to this team. And he did the best he could. Did he have the great year that he had when he led the league in rushing? No, not at all. You know, and, and wasn't able to finish the season, missed the final four games of the, of the year, and now he's on to Green Bay as a, as a free agent. So it's Zamir White time, and I root for Zamir White. He's an easy guy to root for, very easy. You know, his, his heart's in the right place. He's going to go out there and give you everything he's got. Um, you know, he's, he's a student of the game. He learned a lot from Josh Jacobs, but we saw it in a small sample size as well. So can he do it over the course of an 18-week 18, 18 and 17-game season? That's obviously remains to be seen. We won't know, right? How good of a compliment is Alexander Madison to uh, Zamir White? How good of a compliment can Dylan Lobby be, the six-round pick out of New Hampshire, right? What about Amir Abdullah? What's his role? Sincere McCormick, does he have a spot? Brenton Brown, he was a former seventh-round pick. Does he have a spot, right? There's a lot of unknown about the running back room when I felt with Josh Jacobs, at least you knew what you were going to get, right? And anytime he was out there, whether he was number 28 or number eight, you knew he was going to give you everything he got. Can Zamir White... Be that guy to pick up the blitz. 
right? Is he going to be that blocker? That was one of his big struggles when he first came into the league. He was a liability when it came to blocking. Has that improved, right? That was something that Josh Jacobs did really well that I think went unnoticed a lot. So that's an area, and we won't really know about how that room looks until, what, training camp, till preseason, and really, honestly, probably till the first four games of the season, we'll probably have a better idea of what they're looking like. And, of course, that's got to go hand-in-hand with the offensive line, so they've got to find a way to not only get that running back room in in a position where they feel solid about it, but they also have to get on the same page with the offensive line. So it would make sense for the Raiders to find their starting five sooner rather than later. Obviously, that will happen in training camp and preseason. I'm hoping it's not one of those situations where it takes four or five weeks like it did the first year that Josh McDaniels was the head coach. I'm hoping that they have a much better idea of what they're going to do, and I do believe that. I feel like this coaching staff, I'm giving them a lot of credit. I feel like this coaching staff is going to be a lot better than that, and they understand what the, what the task is. They, they understand the assignment, and they're going to go and get that done. But the running back room, the offensive line, obviously those two have to work together really well. Uh, they've got to know you know, when they're going to open up the hole, how they open up the holes. Amir White's going to have to know how to hit the hole, right? Be patient enough to allow the hole to develop and then hit it, right? So there's, obviously there's a lot that goes into it. But those are the two that I'm concerned about, right? Just because I think for both rooms, it's a lot of unknown. The cornerback room, it's a lot of youth. And for the running back room, again, it's just a bunch of unknown because it's new with no Josh Jacobs. So those are two rooms that that are two positions that I want to see how they develop. Unfortunately, with the running backs, you can't tell until they put the pads on and actually start hitting somebody what they really have the opportunity to do. But it all started with the conversation I had with Amber and Kirk Morrison on SiriusXM uh, radio on Tuesday morning. And sometimes that's how it happens. Sometimes a topic all of a sudden pops in my head and I roll with it. Uh, but just because uh, of a question like the one you heard Amber pose to me. So love to get your feedback on that. If there's any uh, position groups that you're concerned about, and of course the quarterback, but I, I took the quarterback out of the conversation because we know we're going to talk a lot about Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew. That's going to be a daily conversation. So uh, that's a no brainer. We know that uh, we know the two guys that are competing for the job and that's what it's going to be. So that's why I took the quarterback out of the room. And I just talked about the cornerbacks and the running back, but let us know. Let me know what you think. 707-654-4693. That's the Lockdown Raider Podcast voicemail line. Of course, coming up in segment number three, we'll get as much of your feedback in as possible, calls and texts. But coming up in segment number two, coming up next, Justin Mello from the Draft Network. He joined my radio show to talk all things Trayvon Merrick. You'll hear that conversation next here on the Lockdown Raiders Podcast. Before we get to that, though, I do want to tell you about the title sponsor of the show, which is FanDuel. And it's winner take all time in the NBA and the NHL. FanDuel's giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. And we know the Boston Celtics, as far as the NBA goes, we know they're representing in the NBA Finals. That was a no-brainer. We believe that the Dallas Mavericks will be as well, but as we saw on uh, on Tuesday, the Minnesota Timberwolves kept their hopes alive, right? They won game four. They're headed back to Minnesota for game five, and all they could do is play one game at a time. But you want to talk about winner-take-all time, that's what it is. I mean, for, for Minnesota, it's... Well, you got to win and, 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 and hold on. Hold on to hope, right? It's elimination game the whole way out for Minnesota. They put themselves in a bad position, and now they got to try to dig themselves out. It's never been done in the history of the NBA. Teams that got down 3 uh, 0 have never come back. 155 0. We'll see if Minnesota could be the first team to break that. But right now, as far as FanDuel goes, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and a whole lot more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every playoff shot count with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right, Raider Nation, here we go. Segment number two of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Want to jump into the conversation I had with my guy, Justin Mello, from the Draft Network. Put out a really good piece on the draftnetwork.com about Trayvon Merrick and uh, how big of a season this could be as he's in the final year of his contract. And it's funny because it just played right into the conversation that we had on Tuesday's uh, edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast where I was talking about, you know, free agents in 2025, guys that could be in line for potential contract extensions prior to the season, guys who may have to wait till after the season and I actually had Trayvon Merrick as a guy that has to wait till after the season so he could prove that he can do it again like he did in 2023 guys I was talking about on Tuesday Malcolm Kuntz Marcus Epps Trayvon Merrick's running buddy Robert Spillane Divine Diablo and Isaiah Palomao and when it comes to Trayvon Merrick uh, not only do I think that he's gonna have to wait till the end of the season based off the fact that he had a really good 2023 but he's been uh, inconsistent so far throughout the course of his career He also has Chris Smith who's sitting behind him. 
uh, who was a sixth round pick out of Georgia, also has Trey Taylor, who was a seventh round pick out of Air Force. Isaiah Palomao, who's going to be a restricted free agent, could be a guy that the Raiders look at and say, yeah, we like him as well. Even though I think Trayvon plays at a higher level than all of those guys, that all could be part of the consideration. So I picked Trayvon Merrick as a guy that had to wait till after the season. But what says Justin Mello? So we started off this conversation talking about how big of a year this is from a monetary point of view for Morrig because, especially with the safeties, the way they're getting paid as of late, uh, the latest being Antoine Winfield Jr. in Tampa Bay, he broke the bank, got big-time money. So here's Justin Mello talking about how big of a, con- a season this could be for Trayvon Merrick based off the money factor. Well, it's very big, right? I mean, to put it into context, this year he's going to earn a base salary of $4.1 million, right? That's in the final year of his deal. That's the most he's earned in a single season from a base salary perspective. You said it, Antoine Winfield Jr., the highest paid safety in NFL history, right, just about a week and a half ago. So it's very clear that uh, if he has a great year here in 2024, Merrick, he can become one of the highest paid safeties potentially in the league. Certainly, uh, at the very least, he'd be doubling right what he's earning this year in 2024. So it goes without saying that from a monetary perspective, a very big season for him here on deck. On the field, he put in a good uh, a good project. You know, his his year in 2023 uh, looked really positive for the Raiders. Looked like it was starting to click for him. What you were able to see, and even just checking out some film, what was it that he did differently last season that kind of made him? Feel fit that role better than he had so far in his career? Well, I thought defensive coordinator Patrick Graham, you know, now in his, it was in his second season coaching him, thought he had a better idea of how to best utilize him. You know, I thought he played near the line of scrimmage a bit more frequently than he did in 2022. That's probably why he had the career highs and tackles with 83. He also showed an ability that, you know, to creep towards that line and play coverage, I think on tight ends, receivers, you know, career highs and PBUs as well and interceptions with eight passes, defense and three interceptions. So I just felt it was a case of both player and coach having a better understanding of how, uh, you know, he fits the defense. Justin Mello from the Draft Network is here with us on Radio Nation Radio 920 talking all things Trayvon Merrick right now as he enters the final year of his rookie contract. And, you know, we had someone bring up compensatory picks and how valuable they are when you try to build a team. How much do you think that's going to go into the conversation when the Raiders decide when and if they're going to give him and offer him a contract extension? I think not a lot in truth because I think every situation is different. Compensatory picks, you know what they're really good for? teams like the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers that have these high-priced superstars can't afford to retain them all, it's key to replace those guys with comp picks. With all due respect, who are the Las Vegas Raiders paying, especially on the offensive side of the ball, right? I mean, right. we're going with Aiden O'Connell and Garden Minshew at quarterback here. You, you, you let Josh Jacobs walk. You've got Zamir Wright at running back. Yeah, they've got you know a couple of high-priced guys, Devontae Adams, Max Crosby, Christian Wilkins. But this is not a team that's going to be up against the salary cap next offseason, right? Not by any stretch of the imagination. So while comp picks are good, you know what's better? Keeping good football players, right? And they can afford to keep this guy on a multi-year deal. So I don't think they're in a position where they're talking about comp picks. That's something, with all due respect, for the annual postseason contenders with quarterbacks that make $50 million a year. That's not the Las Vegas Raiders. It it shouldn't even be a thought going into next offseason. That makes a good point. I mean, bring up a good point. I hadn't thought about it from that angle. They're not really paying anyone big-time money outside of the guys that you mentioned, Wilkins, Crosby, obviously Devontae Adams, but it's not a big plethora of uh, big contracts out there. And, I again, hadn't thought about it like that. Justin Mello from the Draft Network is with us here on Radio Nation Radio 920. So when you look at Trayvon and what he's been able to do and develop, and I think that the presence of Marcus Epps held him in 2023 as well, where do you think that he would probably need to improve a little bit more or show a little bit more to the Raiders and their staff? Well, I'd like to see him uh, you know, be a bit more of a ball hawk in the deep portions of the field. Like I said, I think he's looked most comfortable when playing a little closer to the line of scrimmage. This is a big year for him, but it could also be a good year. You know, I thought he played his best football, again, down the stretch when Antonio Pierce uh, was named interim head coach. So now going into a full season under Pierce, going into his third year under Coach Graham, and having a, a hopefully, you know, again, that, that – chemistry you spoke of with Marcus Epps, guys like Jacorian Bennett, Jack Jones, maybe taking steps forward in the secondary, not to mention, let's not forget 
how much the defensive line has an impact on the secondary, mm-hmm. that ability to get to the quarterback quicker, force ill-advised throws. What kind of impact is Christian Wilkins going to have on Mulroy? You know, that's been a one-man show up front with Max Crosby for the most part. I know Malcolm Koontz has kind of flashed in spurts, but having Christian Wilkins, uh, pressure up the interior is just a game changer. Uh, it was Titans head coach Bill uh, Brian Callahan, excuse me, and I promise this quote will make sense uh, to Raiders <laughs> Nation, talked about the other day how as an offensive play caller, I can deal with pressure off the edge. There are things I can do to mitigate that. I hate pressure up the middle. When the pressure is right in the quarterback's face, that's the one thing I don't know how to account for necessarily. That's what Christian Wilkins is going to bring to this defensive line, and that's the sort of impact it should have on everybody. He's one of 11. As long as he does his job, guys like uh, the safeties, the corners, they're going to benefit from his presence in 2024. You know, it's funny that you bring that up because I was talking about earlier in the show about, you know, position groups that there may still be concern about. And I brought up the cornerback room because I know what Jack Jones could do and I know what Nate Hobbs can do, but I don't know who the other guy across from Jack Jones is going to be as of right now. And it's only May 28th, so I don't have to know exactly who it's going to be. But uh, with that defensive line, especially the addition of Wilkins that you just brought up, uh, that that could really help whoever's going to be there in a major way for that secondary to be a lot better than it even was a year ago. Well, that's the idea, right? When you've got guys like Crosby and Wilkins creating havoc up front, it makes everyone's job easier, right? And I like Jack Jones. I like Nate Hobbs. It's going to be interesting. You, you know who the safeties are and you feel good about them. It is going to be interesting. I, I assume Ja'Cory and Bennett, you know, going into, I believe, what, his second season now, yep. Yep. I, I think will have a stranglehold on the job, at least entering training camp. But those young guys, you know, MJ uh, Devon Shire, Rashad Williams is a rookie I'm very familiar with out of uh, Texas Tech, had a big performance at the Pro Day, uh, the Big 12 Pro Days, a big bodied guy. The Cameron Richardson uh, was a guy, I think he ran a 4 3 6 at the Combine if, or in the 4 3 9s, if I recall correctly. He's a, a rookie fourth rounder. There's some young talent there. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you like proven talent better, especially at corner when you're asked to cover, you know, receivers, especially in the AFC West. But uh, there's some young guys. I like Ja'Cory and Bennett a lot, and we'll see how those other guys, uh, what they can show throughout training camp in the preseason. A bunch of rookies, right? Devon is a rookie too, right? Rookie seventh rounder out yep. of Pitt. So yep. it's going to be interesting to see how those guys develop. The Speaking of youth, uh, in the back end at the safety position, and maybe these guys can impact the decision on what they do with Trayvon Merrick as well. Uh, they drafted Trey Taylor out of Air Force this past year. Chris Smith, they had drafted him out of Georgia the year before. They've got Isaiah Palomao, who's going to be a restricted free agent. He's a guy who's been you know pretty productive when he's on the field uh what do you think about those three guys and how are they going to impact what happens with Trayvon Merrick moving forward well Trey Taylor was a guy that uh, I was very familiar with throughout the pre-draft process I actually did a great interview with him on the draft network you can go read Raiders fans if you want to kind of catch up on who he is uh you know Jim Thorpe award winner six foot 213 pounds had 74 tackles this past year, three interceptions, seven PBUs. I'll be honest, when I watch him on tape, I see more of a special teams demon, and I think that's why the Raiders drafted him. I think he's going to be an outstanding special teams player. Chris Smith, I was a fan coming out of Georgia, but the, the deficiencies were obvious. You know, he did not test well at the combine. He's severely undersized. Uh, there are just, I think, some physical shortcomings there that make it very difficult to project him to a full-time role at the next level. So it'll be intriguing to see what those guys do again. I thought Trey Taylor was very underrated, very easy to pencil him into a special teams role based on what I evaluated coming out of Air Force. But for the most part, I, you know, I, I, you know, maybe you're talking about a proven, proven talent at safety. I don't think those guys are going to have a massive impact on what the Raiders ultimately do with him. I think the ball's in his court. It's really just about, you know, stringing together a, a great second season. Remember, he struggled in 2022, so yeah. it's about proving that 2023 wasn't a fluke uh, and, and becoming really growing into a leadership role and proving that he's a you know a franchise cornerstone piece on this defense. As long as he does that, I think he'll be well positioned to earn an extension from Tom Telesco. You know, and I, I know that the salary cap always goes up, and, and I know he's making a four million dollar base this year. But you know, based off of what Antoine Winfield Jr. received and what some other safeties have received in the past, uh, you know, few extensions. Where do you think the kind of ballpark should be for a Trayvon Merrick saying he puts in a season like he did a season ago? 
I think if he has another good season, I don't quite think he's reaching the heights of Antoine Winfield Jr. I don't right. think we're going to be talking about twenty million a year. You know, that's <laughs> essentially you know high end safety money. But I do think you're looking at something in you know the fourteen to sixteen million dollar per year range. I, and this sounds silly, but you'll know what I mean. I just don't know that he's played an, enough good football for a long enough time. And with the Raiders being a struggling team, I don't know that the reputation is there to command $20 million a year, yeah. right? And Antoine Winfield, Derwin James, Nika Fitzpatrick, those guys that got that kind of money, you're talking about high-end first, you know, high end first-round picks, at least in Fitzpatrick and James's situation, several years of, of good football, Pro Bowl uh, appearances, a lot of media coverage, all that mm-hmm. stuff that sort of helps with those negotiations. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he hits that upper echelon if he has another great year. But I think you're probably looking at somewhere in the middle, something around a $14, $15 million a year contract if all goes well for him this season. Sounds like a good contract to me. Sounds like it's very reasonable. Sounds like it's something that, you know, is, is probably uh, more his ball his, uh, his ballpark because, of, like you said, uh, he hasn't been as consistent as we all thought he was going to be when he entered the NFL. And final question for you, Justin, are you starting to see him play a little bit more free and, and understanding the game a little bit more similar to what he was when he was at his, you know, at TCU and a lot of folks thought, including myself, that he could pot- potentially be a first-round pick? 100%. 100% I am. I think there's no doubt that there was an acclimation period in Patrick Graham's defense. Okay, you saw the 2022 season for him. It was not good, right? His pro football focus coverage grade plummeted to like 49. He allowed 12.2 yards per uh, reception, 29 catches on only 40 targets. It was not a good year. Okay, 2023 went on. He got a lot better. I think you saw the growth in Coach Graham's system. But more importantly, as I said, I think what really flipped the switch was the Antonio Pierce uh, coming in and replacing Josh McDaniels. I thought he played his best ball probably in week 16 against Kansas City and week 18 against mm-hmm. Denver. Of course, in those two weeks, Coach Pierce was already in charge of the team and the defense. So I, I, I do see a player that's gotten a lot more comfortable in the system with the coaches that are around him. The best thing that happened to him this offseason was Pierce keeping the job and Pierce's decision to retain Patrick Graham. There's no doubt about it. There should be a lot of comfortability for him entering 2024. In fact, there's no reason why he shouldn't be more comfortable than ever before. The surroundings are favorable. They're familiar. Uh, I, I see him having a great season here in 2024. So that was my conversation from Tuesday with Justin Mello from the Draft Network talking all things Trayvon Merrick. And he's putting together uh, a really good you know, series where he's going through all 32 teams and picking one guy who this could be a huge season for. So the re- guy who represented for the Raiders was one, Trayvon Merrick. He's also putting together a piece on one undrafted from each I wonder when undrafted free agents I should say from each team that has a good shot of making the team and that's going to drop for the Raiders pretty soon as well so when uh, you know when he does that I'll bring that to the table and we'll discuss it as well but what's on your mind what are you thinking where's the feedback that you've been hitting the Lockdown Raider podcast voicemail line at 707-654-4693 we'll hear that coming up in segment number three coming up next here on the Lockdown Raiders podcast Here we go, Raider Nation. Segment number three of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Your calls and texts draft that Locked On Raider podcast voicemail line, 707-654-4693. Let's start things off with Raider Meatloaf. He's calling to provide some clarity on the quarterback conversation when it comes to Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew. Here he is, Raider Meatloaf. Thank you. It's uh, Raider Meatloaf here. Um, just wanted to hit on some of the, the calls that have been coming in on the on the negative side of things with people upset that Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew is going to be our quarterback. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if we drafted somebody. It doesn't matter if somebody fell to us. It would be the same narrative. You know, we, oh, it, there would be a huge question mark of, around the position. At least we have somebody in the building that's already had their sophomore season coming around the corner. Just like C.J. Stroud, it's like everybody, the hype on C.J. Stroud right now, and I believe it, I think C.J. Stroud's amazing, but it might be unrealistic as to what's going to happen for this coming year for the Texans as well, too. Every single quarterback that got drafted last year that's now a sophomore, there's still question marks around it. So, you know, that's just some food for thought that people would be saying the same exact thing as if we had a quarterback in the building. I think the only reason people wouldn't say that is if we drafted somebody like Caleb Williams, if we had somebody like Drake May, Jaden Daniels, 
Bo Nix, whoever it is, Michael Pinnock, they would they would be saying the same thing that, oh, we're six and a half win team or this and that. It doesn't matter. But what we do have is we have leaders on the team. And we still wouldn't build our, our team around the quarterback even if we drafted one this year. You know what I mean? So, all right, man, take care. Milo, thanks so much for the call. Appreciate you. And the good thing about O'Connell and Minshew situation is these guys have won in the league, right? And for Aiden, he's been on the team, not a fourth-round pick rolling in with no idea what to expect. Both guys have a new system to learn. And, you know, whoever does that at the end of the day, you know, and puts the best the team in the best position to succeed uh, will be the quarterback. You know, we'll see what happens. Obviously, training camp will be a big deal. Preseason will be a big deal. But both guys – you know, have the ability to win games in the National Football League. And I believe Aiden O'Connell has an opportunity just to get better. Like, we don't know what his ceiling is. I think we have a good idea what Gardner Minshew's ceiling is, but even in a new system, maybe it's something that clicks for him and he does even better than expected. But I do think that, you know, if, if the worst-case scenario happened, which is they didn't get to go into the draft and get a superstar quarterback that they think uh, could be their franchise quarterback for years to come, I don't think this is a bad fallback plan to have Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew. I just, I just don't. I think that, and I said it the whole draft time, that if they had to go and start a game on Sunday with one of those two guys under center, they'd be in an okay position. And I do think that's where the Raiders are. Thanks so much for the call. I appreciate you. Up next, got a text from B. Chavez. He says, Q, it's B. Chavez here. Love the show. Keep up the great work. A thought that has been on my mind is, and it might be an unpopular opinion, but I think week one versus the Chargers might be the most important game for AP. Having to go against Jim Harbaugh, a proven winner who many fans preferred over AP, has to be a heavy thought in AP's mind. I understand the team has bought in, but this win might unify the Raider Nation completely while giving the team even more confidence to be great this season. Obviously, if we were to lose, the season goes on, but a win here has higher impact than maybe any other game with the exception of games leading to playoff probability down the line. Thanks, Q. Appreciate you. Go Raiders. That's from B. Chavez. And thanks so much for the text. I appreciate you. And honestly, I think that first game is super important just to set set the tone. Get off to a good start. Start off 1-0. Win in SoFi Stadium where you haven't had a lot of success. The Raiders so far in SoFi, even though the fan base will show up and show out there, they're only 1-4. So they haven't had that sustained success there in SoFi Stadium. So that would be nice to start off. Uh, Obviously, getting a win over Jim Harbaugh uh, would be a nice little feather in the cap for AP. But I think more importantly, over getting a win over over Jim Harbaugh is just getting a win, period. Right? Just letting, letting the Raiders know and letting Raider Nation know that, yeah, this team is headed in the right direction. Starting off with a win is always great, especially when you got Baltimore the next week. So, uh, you know, that's going to be a tough one, right? I mean, the Chargers, I don't think are going to be an easy game. I don't think there's any easy game on the schedule, but I still think that they're still going to be in a feeling out process, trying to put the pieces together process. Don't think that Jim Harbaugh is going to have instant success, right? I don't think he's going to come out the gates and go like seven and one to start the season. I think he's going to be successful. I think he's going to get that team turned around, but how quickly is it going to happen? I'm not sure. I just think it's going to take a little while. So my expectation is that they go into L.A. and they beat the Chargers week one. And then the real test, the huge test comes in Baltimore the next week, right? It's the hardballs back to back, Jim and then John. But Baltimore is a team that played in the AFC Championship game a year ago for the opportunity to go to the Super Bowl. So you want a real measuring stick? All right. OK, you, you were able to get through Jim. Now what do you do with John? <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's going to be uh, the, the real, real test. So, you know, that that's obviously is a, a is important game. You want to be able to start the season one and oh and then head on, you know, on the road to Baltimore, a real true road game and see, you know, how that shakes out before you head back home to Carolina. So ideally, a worst case scenario after those two games, the Raiders are sitting there one and one. So for all your your points that you're talking about, that week one game are very valid. I'm with you on it. But also just to get off to a good start, just to set things uh, you know, off the right way, I think it's important for the Raiders to win that game as well. Uh, up next, got a call from Trucker Ken in Central Florida. He's calling to talk about who he thinks the third wide receiver could be for the Raiders in this offense, Lou, led by Luke Getze, and he explains why. Here he is, Trucker Ken in Central Florida. Yo, what up, Q? This is Trucker Ken from Central Florida. Hey, I just got done listening to your podcast. You know, it's great as usual. Every morning I wake up get ready for work, make my deliveries to the first thing I put on. And I really do appreciate it, everything you do for the nation. Uh, I'm answering, I'm going to try to answer one of the questions you posed yesterday, which is who's going to be that third wide receiver uh, on our, in our lineup. And my, my opinion, I think it's going to be Brock Bowers. I think Bowers is going to be the guy that steps up and fills in that void 
um, in the wide receiver room. I think, you know, he's a tight end, obviously, but I think he's big, he's fast. And I think as the season progresses, we're going to start to realize just how good this kid is. You know, he's a Ferrari. And you line him up in the slot, and he's going to cause problems for these slot corners. Uh, corner can't guard him, safety can't guard him, and a linebacker definitely can't guard him. Um, so I think we're going to utilize him like they do in Kansas City with Travis Kelsey. We'll motion him back and forth, try to get the matchups that, uh, that we see that he can take advantage of. And I think that as the year goes on, we're going to realize real quickly this kid's a stud, and he's going to be he's going to be that guy slipping into that third wide receiver spot, even though he's a true tight end. I think he's going to end up being, you know, a hybrid type guy that's going to eventually be the mold moving forward. So, anyway, just my opinion, and uh, curious to get your opinion on it. Love what you do. Go Raiders. Ken, thanks for the call, my man. I appreciate you, and, you know, I think you're spot on. Right, that makes all the sense of the world with Brock Bowers. Yeah, he's a tight end. There's no doubt, but we know he's a weapon. Uh, there's a reason why a lot of folks are saying, "Wow, can't believe he was there at number 13." Wow, man, the Raiders really got a really good player if they can get a quarterback to get him the rock. I mean, this dude could do some big time things, and he was able to do some big time things in the SEC. So, yeah, I mean, even though he's not labeled a wide receiver, uh, that that does make a lot of sense because he's going to uh, have a lot of wide receiver tendencies. He's just an ultimate weapon. You can line them up all over the field. So that makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, and, and, and honestly, you know, you talked about Travis Kelsey in, in Kansas City and what he's able to bring to the table as, a, you know, as the tight end. He's probably the number one option, but he also doesn't have Devontae Adams and Jacoby Myers playing with him, <laughs> right? And so with De- Devontae and Jacoby, I can see Brock Bowers being uh, number three. Uh, but, you know, on, on a lot of teams, he might be number one as good as he is. So, uh, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and he, he should make a big addition to this Raiders offense and do what Tom Telesco said when they drafted him. The Raiders didn't score enough touchdowns in 2023. He's going to help them do just that. Thanks so much for that call, my man. I definitely appreciate you. Up next, got a text from Ohio Raider 419. Says, Q, what's going on? This time of the year is fun discussing how we can get into the playoffs. But as they say, it's why we play the games. AFC is very difficult this year. But I think it'll be very important for our team to get off to a good start. It will give the team a lot of confidence and especially our quarterback. I still say we just need to be patient. It's a long season. We know injuries will occur. That changed the whole complexion of a team and changed the AFC standings. Our D will be solid. I believe in the coaching staff, so better days are ahead. All we have to do is just win, baby, and the playoffs will handle themselves. That's Ohio Raider from the 419. Yeah, and I understand that completely, and that's why we're just talking about it right now in May, right? But if you look at it, we talked about 11 teams that could potentially be in the playoffs from the AFC uh, conference alone. And then another two teams that, you know, didn't make the playoffs either in 2023 that are expected to be really good in the Jets and the Chargers. So literally we talked about 13 teams for seven spots. That's a lot, right? And, and you're right. Injuries are going to happen to all teams, including the Raiders. And really it's about the teams that are the, you know, the, uh, the healthiest when it's all said and done. Now Houston has a tough schedule. They got a first place schedule and they got a lot of, uh, you know, playoff teams that they're going to be playing in 2024. So that's going to be a tough out. Buffalo as a division champ, no Stephon Diggs. Can Josh Allen carry the load? Possibly. Baltimore, I think they're going to be right where they were. Kansas City, I think they're going to be really good. You know, the wild cards, as we talked about, Cleveland, big question there with Deshaun Watson. Uh, how can that, that team take that next step? Is Miami going to take that next, next step? Pittsburgh, Russell Wilson, right? Two different quarterbacks haven't won a Russell Wilson. Now he's a starting quarterback in Pittsburgh. You know, is Justin Fields going to get an opportunity to start? The Bengals, the number eight seed, will Joe Burrow be healthy all season? The Jaguars, will Trevor Lawrence be that guy who was 8-3 and three at one point, and then they ended up going 9-8 and eight when it was all said and done? The Colts, a lot of folks are high on the Colts. Me, not so much. A lot of people think that Anthony Richardson is going to take that natural step, even though the thing he lacked coming into the NFL he still lacks, which is experience. And then the Raiders are there at the number 11 spot, right? Is, is Aiden O'Connell able to take that next step? Is a year, uh, you know, as, as Antonio Pierce, the head coach, does that make a huge difference? Is that worth two, three more wins? as opposed to what they did last year, getting eight wins? Maybe, right? Obviously, that's why they play the games. Like you mentioned, the Jets, is Aaron Rodgers going to really lead them to the promised land like they think? And is Jim Harbaugh, is he, you know, can he turn water into wine? Uh, that's what they're hoping. 
<laughs> right? That's what the Charger fans are hoping, that he's going to be the miracle worker. So, I mean, that's 13 teams that you can make a case for why they could potentially be uh, playoff teams are right there on the outside looking in, including the Raiders. So, yeah, there, there's a reason why they play the games, but I thought it was an intriguing conversation because you look at the NFC, and I think you can pick the seven teams that are going to make the playoffs, and I think you'd probably be pretty close to 100%. You might be at 95%, <laughs> right? I mean, I, it's just the AFC and the NFC are two different animals, and the AFC is the much bigger batter of the two. Thanks so much for that text. I do appreciate you. We'll close out. Uh, with a call from Mariachi512 out of Austin, Texas. He's calling to give us his win total thoughts for the Raiders in 2024 and why. Here he is, Mariachi512 out of Austin, Texas. This is Mariachi512 out of Austin, Texas, and this is how I feel about the upcoming season. I believe we will get at least two more wins coming into this season for the following reasons. Our coaching change. We have Antonio Pierce rather than that other coach. We have our defensive tackle, Christian Wilkins, that we acquired. Our defense will be better. Our quarterback play, we have our second year with Aiden O'Connell. We also have more offensive weapons, Brock Bowers. This means we'll score more points, our defense will be better, and we'll have better morale on our team. I believe we will win at least 10 games, possibly 11 or 12. This is Mariachi 512. Thank you. Out. My man, thanks so much for the call. Great stuff. Two more wins. I can see that. You know, that's in my window as well. Obviously, the Raiders were 8-9 and nine in 2023. My window was 9-8 and eight to 10-7, and seven, right? Obviously, 9-8 and eight is only one more win, but I kind of feel like that that's the sweet spot for the Raiders and should be the sweet spot in 2024. But, you know, as our guy, Ohio Raider at 419 said, there's a reason why they play the games. We could talk about it. We can give our projections all we want, but they got to go out there and they got to get it done. It is a production-based business. It's all about wins. We can have all the feel-good stories we want, but it's all about wins. Right, you can you can be a motivational guy. You can be a guy that everyone loves, but you got to find a way to win. If not, they'll be you'll be on the first thing smoking. That's just how the National Football League works. So uh, there are questions. The O line, we talked about that. We talked about the running back room and the cornerback room uh, in segment number one. But for the most part, I feel like this is a pretty solid team. And if they can get good, consistent quarterback play, I think they could be in for a hell of a season. But the key is going to get good, consistent quarterback play. That's one of the biggest words. The big C word consistent, right? I mean, I, I say it all the time. It's great to be a 10 every once in a while, uh, but it's great to be an eight consistently, right? If you're a 10 every once in a while, that's great. But if you're a 10 and then you're a three and then you're a five and then you're a seven and then you're a 10, then you're an eight, then you're a six. And you know what I mean? If you're all up and down like a roller coaster, that's not good. But if you're consistently a seven or eight, I'll take that. I'll take my chances because at least I know what I'm going to get from you each time out. That's what uh, they're really looking for from that quarterback position. Consistent, quarterback play if you can do that you have a chance that's all i got time for on today's show still got a text from la raider steve got a call from southwest florida raider good conversation we might have to put that in its own segment for tomorrow not too sure obviously we'll have a lot coming off of today the otas uh, we'll talk to different coordinators looking forward to talking to uh, assistant head coach marvin lewis uh, we'll be talking to players following practice and i will love to come back and give you a report on what i was able to see from OTA. So that's going to be an exciting part of the show as well, but definitely going to get that calls and text in. Uh, going to get your feedback, news and notes, plenty of conversation as we keep the party rolling. And it'll already be Thursday tomorrow. That's that short week, man. That short week gets you every time, right? So before you know it, the week will be over. But I uh, love the conversation we're having again uh, late May, and we're able to consistently put out these shows each and every day. So until tomorrow, Ray Nation, take care of yourself, take care of your family, love on your family. Most importantly, as always, just win, baby.